everybody. Welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. Today we're talking with Rabbi Gerfine again. Uh, we weren't able to do it last week. There were some things that came up, but but he's available this week. And uh, if you didn't see the last video, I would encourage you to go watch it. You don't have to watch these in order, but essentially what we're doing is I, I was wanting him to just kind of go through and talk about the 12 tribes of Israel. But the last video was kind of like a precursor where we talked about the four mothers uh, of Israel, the four matriarchs, however you want to think of them, because uh, that ties in uh, to, to the rest of it, uh, the way that I see it. And we started to kind of talk about uh, Judah. Um, let me just share a couple of the notes just really quick so we can kind of pick up where we left off. So the notes that I took, Rabbi Gerfine had talked about how Judah, you know, when we're thinking about the camp of Israel, the, the way that the Israelites camped around the tabernacle or the Mishkan in the desert as they were as they were uh, wandering, they were grouped into um, groups of three. And on the east side uh, of the tabernacle was uh, Judah, Issachar, and uh, Zebulun. And Judah, the reason why is because essentially... The, it, Okay, so basically, Judah is the one that leads the rest of Israel into the light. Uh, the word uh, you'd said Misra, so that's east, and it's where from where it shines. You know, the sun, like so, like leading into the light. Um, and so Judah is the one that does that. Um, he's the leader because he can go into the darkness and turn it into light. Uh. Also, you have the concept of Judah being the hidden one. Like when you think of King David, for example, he was just kind of an unknown uh, nobody, essentially, to everybody else. But he ended up bec becoming the King David, uh, the the one that started the Davidic line. And, uh, and then we talked about Judah, the individual, and how uh, the patriarch Judah, how he went through his own transformation and that's what God wants us to do is, you know, even though we might make mistakes in life and such, uh, we should change and transform ourselves. And so that's kind of just like a quick little recap about Judah. And I was just wondering, is there anything else about Judah, whether it's the man or the tribe that you'd like to add before we move on to, uh, I guess, like, I don't know if Issachar would be next that you'd want to talk about. Sure. I mean, you know, we could and on another 10 years worth, but in brief, <laughs> the Hebrew word Yehuda, which is where the word Yehudi, the word Jew, comes from, is from the name Judah. Mm -hmm. Right? Like it says by Mordechai, it says Mordechai Ha Yehudi, means Mordechai the Jew, but it, it was referring to Judah from the tribe of Judah, even though he was technically from the tribe of Benjamin. But the thing that's amazing about his name, if you look at it in the holy language, is you'll see that the four letters of God's name are four of the five letters of his name plus the letter Dalit. So on the one level, the letter Dalit is a hint that from Judah would come David, because David is Dalit. Mm -hmm. and also, the letter Dalit also always infers uh, humility, because it, it, the technical word Dalit is really from the word Dal. Dal means poor in Hebrew. There are different types of poor. There's spiritual poor, physical poor, but but in brief, dal means as a form of, of uh, poverty. But it, it doesn't. In fact, King David said about himself, "Ani ve'evion ani," which means I am a, a ani, which is a physically poor person, and I am an evion, which is a spiritually poor person, which is quite ridiculous because he was maybe one of the most spiritually evolved people ever in the history of the planet. Plus, he was extraordinarily wealthy. So how could he refer to himself by that, by, in those terms? Because he did so realizing that nothing that he has was his. It was all on loan from God. So he didn't feel it's mine. And therefore, that's the idea of Judah. The reason Judah has the strength to go into anything is, on the one hand, because he's humbled himself. And therefore, he realizes that his fantastic physical fighting powers, which were extremely strong, uh, he was one of the strongest of all of the tribes in the military. But he realized that all that power is God's power. And by, I think I once mentioned to you the word ego, we always look at as an acronym for edging God out. So therefore, by not being filled with himself, yeah, right, right, edging God out. <laughs> I, I like that. 
<laughs> so therefore, by not being filled with himself, he made room for God, so to speak. And therefore, that was the dollar. Now, the Yud Kei Vav Kei, of course, being God's name, was also a great source of his power. But, but therefore, his power was by realizing that his attachment to God was really by making himself a vessel for God. Not in God forbid an arrogant way, you know. Hey, here's God, my buddy. I'd like you to meet, you know, Jared. Jared, this is God. But rather that it's a sense of of clearing the deck for that godliness to come into the world. That is a really interesting insight. The the whole thing with sharing the same letters as the name is of God, and then include, and then in addition, the Dalit. And by the way, of course, uh, I'm sure most of you like understand from the context, but Dalit, that's like the English equivalent of D. It's the D sound, you know, so Judah as the Dalit. Um, okay. The way you sound, said it sounds like Homer Simpson, Judah. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, that's really that's interesting. <laughs> well, okay, so maybe from this point, unless there was anything else that you wanted to like for sure share about the tribe of Judah or, or anything else. Well, you know, uh, one more yeah. little thing you might enjoy, which is because you know a little Hebrew. Uh, what Hebrew word does Judah sound like? I don't know Hebrew that well, so oh, okay. I don't know. I'm it's still at the very, very beginning, still just trying to get the letters, right. and I we're recognize all, some words. We're all at, always at the beginning. That's the important thing to remember. However, how about if I said the word Toda? Does that sound familiar? Oh yeah, Toda. That's like. Um, isn't that kind of like uh excuse me or like no, 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 no. oh what's to is it thank you toda yes. Yes. yeah okay toda i remember coming across that toda and yeah. how about another word that's often used in the psalms hodu i don't know that one hodu means uh, it's also a way of thanks but it's thanks through praise so these are in their roots all connected judah toda hodu these are all words because he was such a humble man, as you know, in the biblical story, uh, he had thought that his former daughter-in-law had committed adultery and he was going to carry out her death sentence, which was the nature of the court in those days. And her, his, the, and Tamar, rather than embarrassing Judah in public, because really it was Judah who had slept with her. So she gave little things and she says, well, whoever owns these, that's the man that was the father of my baby. And when he received them, he looked, he saw they were his, and he realized that how much greater she was than he was, because she was willing to die rather than embarrass him in public. And he even said, Satka me many, she's even more righteous than me. And therefore, it became an experience of his hum, even though he was a tremendous leader, he humbled himself before the truth. And that's what saying thank you is. Thank you is recognizing what somebody else does to you. And Hodu is recognizing what God does to you. So those were great character traits that he had. And even though he was a magnificent leader, he would always humble himself before the truth. It's amazing. Okay. Well, uh, and then before we, we move on, I guess one last thing to probably mention, I'm sure everybody already knows this, but uh, the Jews of today, I, I, Probably primarily, and I guess no one really knows, um, except for Elijah, right? We've talked about Elijah. Um, but probably the majority of Jews today are are primarily descended from the tribe of Judah. But also, uh, traditionally, we have um, a, a sizable portion of Benjamin with them today. And then, of course, the Levites, which would include the uh, um, Leviim and the Kohanim, which are the the priests, you know, the the descendants of of Aaron, and so, but, and if from previous conversations, previous conversations, my understanding from what you said is that there's probably others of the other tribes that are you know mixed in, but just we don't really know, and right. uh, probably not in big numbers because we know from Jeremiah that the ten tribes had been removed long before the conquest of Jerusalem. Yeah. And then in the case of Simeon, I, I can't remember if I talked to you about this or not, but with uh, the tribal land given to Simeon, they were the only tribe that were encompassed by another tribe. And from what, I, what I've what i studied and seen, I can't remember if you had already said something about this, but Simeon seems to have probably at an earlier time been assimilated into Judah. I just don't know. That, are you, you do mean, forgive me, do you mean Shimon? Sh Shimon, Simon? yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. I, just, I thought maybe there was a Chinese tribe. I didn't know. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Yeah. He was absorbed. This was because of Jacob. When Jacob on his deathbed was 
blessing, or I should say uh, ordering, not ordering like commanding, but like arranging how the tribes will ex coexist in the land of Israel, he very much wanted to make sure that uh, Shimon and Levi, or Simon and Levi, would not be together because he had seen when those two powers get together, they could create tremendous uh, war as they did when they wiped out the city of Shechem. So therefore, neither of those city uh, tribes, excuse me, had their own land. The Levites had cities as opposed to real territory. And, and Simon, Shimon, was absorbed inside the tribe of Judah. And the reason he did that is because, as we actually ties in very nicely, because since we said that uh, Judah's greatest, one of his great powers was the humility and in the face of truth, then Jacob thought that Simon needed to learn that. Because if you're not humble in the face of, not you, God forbid, if a person is not humble in the face of truth, they can become arrogant in the face of truth. They can become very self-righteous. They can become very holy in, a, in an impure way. I know that sounds funny, but they can become very holier than thou. And this is a terrible thing before God. And so therefore, what that leads to then is anger. Because a person who's holy thinking, that is, that they're impressing God as if that's going to impress God by showing off how holy they are because they hold the truth, then that will lead to violence because it will lead to anger and then it'll lead to violence. And that's the last thing that God has in mind on his planet. So therefore, Jacob wanted to get that DNA out of the system and by ensconcing them among Judah, that they would learn from Judah the idea of instead of being arrogant for God, to be humble for God. Okay, great. So um, this would probably be a good point to move on to um, Issachar, because again, uh, everyone, and by the way, I'm going to leave a link in the description below to, uh, this is for the Institute Manual for Numbers chapters 1 through 10. And it has a, it has like a picture of the order of March and then uh, the camp of Israel. But so in this video, like I said earlier, I think we're probably going to just be focusing now on uh, Issachar and Zebulun. And so um, can we move on to the next one? Would the next one, as far as like, because um, I, I know that I know that each of the three group or each of the four groups, there was like one tribe that was kind of the, the leader of the other two as they were wandering. So Judah, in this case, would be the leader of, of these two. Was there a seniority after that? Like, would there be, uh, would Issachar be the next one in line in that group? Yeah, I mean, um, if you think of it as a, a kind of a square, right? Here's your one, two, three, four. So it unfolded in the way that uh, when the first one, which let's say would east would move, then south would then move, and then west would then move, and then north would then move. So it would turn into a line. And of course, the Mishkan and the Levium inside that, that move mm -hmm. and so same thing when judah would then camp then the next one would camp and the mishkan in the middle and then around it so that that is how that's the hierarchy so the four leaders again back to our number four the four leaders the first of the four was judah and each sub set or sub tribes these were all part of the composition in other words if you have it if you have three points you become what they call in greek a delta like an arrow, it's right. It's called Hebrew, so that the the arrow, the the thrust of it is Yehuda, but he's he's um, his engines are the next two behind him. So each leader is the main concept, but these but insufficient without the plugins of the two that are behind him. So Issachar and Zvulun, that's at least how we meant to pronounce the name. But I'm getting, I'm getting. It's good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, in English, it's like with a B, it's Zebulun, but I I, try, uh, I don't know. I kind of go back and forth. An N, and then be like nebulous. Yeah. But, but, but the thing is, yeah, okay, whatever. It doesn't matter. As long as we get to the point and understand the same person. So Issachar and Zebulun are a very interesting um, group because they have their own special relationship between them that really is not recorded about any other two brothers. I mean, maybe, okay, the brotherly love of, of uh, Joseph, Yosef with Binyamin, but but in terms of really ongoing relationship that lasted for thousands of years, 
There was a special relationship between the two of them. Why? Because Issachar was known to be the smartest of the Jewish tribes. They were the ones that could do the intercalculation of the planets and the moons and all the different moments down to split seconds. They're the ones who had this incredible ability of, of tremendous wisdom. And Zavulin, on the other hand, became uh, extraordinary businessmen. They were the ones that had the ships that set sail and traveled all around the known world doing commerce and business and things of this nature. Now, what the two of them did is they got the debt together and they made a business deal, a spiritual business deal. Because Zavulin, also every Jew, hopefully, every, every Jew that's been exposed to Torah, and unfortunately there are not many of them these days, but it's growing, to the detriment of the whole world, by the way. But therefore, um, they understood, I mean, what, what else should a Jew be doing but learning God's Torah and sharing it with the world? I mean, what could be better, right? Just coming up with our, our more TikToks. So they said, since we have to go work, we're losing all that time we could be studying. So therefore, we're going to make a deal. We're going to finance you, Issachar, so you guys can just sit and study day and night, and we'll, and we'll go and work on your behalf. Now, in our religion, you can actually sell spirituality. But the beauty of selling spirituality as opposed to selling something physical is if I have a you know, if I if I have this pencil, I sell it to you. You now have a pencil. I don't have that pencil because that's physical. But if you have a fire and I let you take from my fire, my fire is not diminished. And now you have fire as well. Mm. So since spirituality is equated with fire, therefore, uh, by Yisachar agreeing to the deal, Zvulin got the same amount of Torah reward, if you will. I hate to say it sounds like Boy Scouts, but it keeps the idea simple. And on the same hand, Issachar doesn't lose. So now they're, they're both benefiting. However, to take it a step further, the name Zavulin is mentioned before the name Issachar often because he was greater than Issachar. Even though Issachar was doing the actual study and as a result of it became the wisest tribe of all the tribes, but because Zavulin was the one who understood and supported them, that made them, in God's eyes, in a will, in a way, even higher. So that's why a woman's heaven, in a certain way, is higher than men's hell. Hell, excuse me. Not men's heaven. Love is not hell. <laughs> <laughs> when I when I get upset with my wife, I can say, "Yeah, yeah, no, no. I know you mean well." So <laughs> I'm sure that. But the reason, because the woman has the capability of serving or supporting men in a way, in many ways, emotional ways, and so on. And I know that sounds very anti-Western because you want to be the, you know, not you, but the person wants to be like the alpha dog. Definitely not bottom, me. <laughs> yeah, but, but the bottom line is that it, we find from Moses and from all of these other great leaders that their greatness was in servitude. So from God's perspective, the more a person that serves others actually makes them greater than the ones that they actually serve. So Zvulun became greater because of his willingness to support Issachar. But that's that's a very unusual relationship. Just one more thing about Zvulun you might find interesting. It says that when the nations came to Israel during the days of King Solomon, so they would come to Jerusalem, especially the first temple, they would see things that were mind-blowing, such as the fire that used to come down every day out of heaven uh, in the shape of a lion, which is why one of the names of the temple is Ariel, which means God is the Lion King. Not to be confused. Oh, that's with one him. of the names of the temple. Yes, okay. but it, right. Not to be confused with the the movie Lion King. It's Ariel. <laughs> okay, so, Hakuna Matata. But nonetheless, <laughs> that idea is that they saw these incredible miracles. That was just one of, of many. But in terms of actually wanting to take a, an an active role in becoming involved in the commandments of God, which are open to the whole world. It didn't really, it's like, okay, that was amazing. Disneyland was just awesome. But, you know, now you're in the car and you're heading home. But the place that impact, it says, uh, the greatest desire of the nations to want to become involved in helping in the service of God was actually through the tribe of Zvulun. Why? Because it says there that when the people would come in on their boats into the ports where Zvulun was, 
they noticed things which they didn't see in Marseille or Brindisi or all these other, you know, European ports. I don't know about today, but in those days, they didn't see people selling uh, knockoff Rolex watches. <laughs> they didn't see people with big open boxes of contrabands that were stolen off the ships. They didn't see prostitutes in the port cities because the sailors are coming in with money. In fact, they didn't see anything like that. They saw on the actual uh, piers that tables had been set up where the Zvulun sailors would learn Torah while waiting for their turn for their boats to take off. And mm -hmm. this made a very deep impact because to see a holy person in the working world being very careful about all of his or her business being honest and making sure that everything is ethical in what they do and not losing perspective that it's not my money, it's God's money anyhow, that is something a person can relate to. Because then you go back over to Marseille and you see the things that you see almost in every major port. That was another big aspect about Zavulin. I want to look at something really quick. Um, would you be able to do the screen, The allow me to do screen share? Because I want to pull up... <clears throat> I have a graphic here of uh, okay. You're good. the land of Israel. I just have to find it really quick. I wasn't planning on pulling this up, but let's see. Yeah, hey, I got a graphic right out my window. <laughs> it's a good graphic. Okay, screen <laughs> share. Better than virtual reality. All right. So <clears throat> this is what, this is something produced uh, by my church. I'm looking for. Okay, there's Asher up there. Zevulin is so it looks like they're kind of like right there. Um together. Kind of like, yeah. Well, yeah, look at that. They're right next to each other. Mm -hmm. So Zevul because Zevulin was really into business, they were there was like a lot of them in the port cities over here. Correct. Okay. And so they would have been the ones that mostly traders would have like probably come in contact with or or seen. And so okay. Well, there was a large traffic coming in from all over the world to the land of Asher, because that's where the, the the real high quality oil was. Asher's right there. Okay. That's interesting. I, I never would have like thought until this conversation, like realizing that their land inheritance was right next to each other. Yeah, I told you that's about their special relationship. Is there um any significance to the size because like compared to some of the other ones they're like among the smaller uh in, well yeah in fact even like it seems like smaller than dan because if you take this one up here and this one down there that's bigger maybe benjamin is close in size to isekar but is there any anything as to why they didn't get as much land well the land depended on the population of the tribe that's as it says in the bible that joshua divided the land according to first of all there was a uh, kind of a mystical lottery if you will mm -hmm. but that's a separate in other words the, uh joshua had two boxes and one box had these um uh i forgot what you would call these in english uh, tabs maybe for lack of better words and on each tab was a name of a portion of israel and the other box had the same kind of tabs and all these tabs were exactly the same so you couldn't like feel which was which and it had the name of the tribes and he would announce that i am now going to lift out the tribe of Shimon, and I'm now going to lift out a lottery, which was part of the prophetic exposure as to what was happening here. And sure enough, voila, that's what came out. So then it put this one with that one. But but the miracle of it all was that how could you be doing this lottery thing? Because what if one of the smallest tribes wound up with one of the largest portions of, of the land? So again, this was kind of to uh, let us to remind us that God is the facilitator. So therefore, even though it seemed to be completely like, you know, draw of the luck or whatever, luck of the draw, or whatever you call it in English, nonetheless, it was really the hand of God transposed through Joshua's hand, because in fact, each one came up with exactly the lot they were supposed to have, which was more of a, uh, a calculated element, as I said, based on the, on the population. There's a dispute as to what population was actually used. Was it the numbers as they first came out of Egypt? Or was it were the numbers now forty years later, as after after being in the desert, now they're about to go into the land of Israel? But either way, it was prior prior to entering into Israel, it was already determined 
who would be getting what, and that primarily was based on the size of the tribes. Okay. And then um, <clears throat> I'm looking at this. I'd never noticed this before looking at this graphic. It, it says that there was like a boundary change here around 950 BC um, between Judah and the northern and nor the northern kingdom, like right here, this blue line, da 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 da. Um, through time, Which, would this have like would these boundaries have ever changed? Do you think? Like you and I had spoken before, because I was like, in Judaism, when Messiah comes, like would uh, all these land uh, portions be restored? Would they be expanded? And I think that you had said that um, essentially they would be expanded. Uh, I didn't think the Bible says it. If right. you look carefully, when when God promises the land to Abraham, how many of the Canaanite nations does he count? Oh, Bible, no. 20. What? 20? <laughs> no, no, that was a joke, like a quiz oh. show. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. I, ah, I... Okay, so have a look. When you see, you'll see that Abraham is promised by God 10 nations. Those 10 are almost never repeated. Sometimes you'll have seven. Sometimes they'll even be six. But maybe one other time does it ever recall the 10. And that is because the 10, and as you know probably from hanging out with me, the 10 is always considered that mystical number because it's the one letter in the Hebrew alphabet that doesn't come down into this world, it floats in the air. So therefore that, and also you'll see in Psalms, Many times, uh, King David will pre uh, precedent in, uh, introduce his uh, psalm by saying a uh, harp of certain amount of strings. So the harp of the ten chord string is the ones that always are referring to messianic times, as opposed to when he talks about the harp of seven and eight strings. So when God was referring to Abraham, so he said ten because we have a rule, which is that... The last thing that happens is the first thing that's thought of. So therefore, the first thing God thought of was to tell Abraham, you're getting 10 tribes. I'm uh, sorry, 10, ten uh, nations. Yeah, if we go off, just hit the same button again, okay? Okay, yeah. Uh, but that therefore will be the last thing that will happen. So that will only happen in the Messianic period when those 10 nations will be the nations that will form the land of Israel, which of oh, course wait, is Yeah, now, now I remember you. Okay, now I remember exactly what you're talking about in the book. Okay, sorry, I just I just realized, okay, okay yeah, 10. Okay. Wait till you get my age, you won't remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but of course, we don't talk about this in front of the United Nations because they'll freak out completely that we're <laughs> out to conquer the world. So. Yeah. Okay. That okay, line, so by the way, if I understood correctly, what that border change is, is because that was then the time just see you know, what year does it say? Uh, uh, well, the not, border change I, I it says know. 950 BC. I'm not good on the on the English years. Anyhow, but it probably was. I'm just going to assume here the time when the country split between it then became Judah and Israel. The northern country be called was Israel. The ten tribes and the other two were still, uh, you know, that's because if you notice that line, it excludes Jerusalem. Right. See yep. that it's above Jerusalem. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so during the time of the 10 tribes, they actually recreated a, a couple, a numerous amount of golden calves, as in the, the golden calf of the, you know, Sinai experience. And mm -hmm. and they were told you can worship these now. You don't have to go to Jerusalem anymore. They actually set up centuries along the border. So Jews from the north would not go to Jerusalem anymore. Wow. Well, and by the way, everybody, uh, just uh, going back to the beginning of the conversation, here's Simeon. This is what I was talking about down here. Uh, Simeon being encompassed by Judah, which is in the green. Um, going back to Zebulun and Issachar. Um, okay, so you said that the reason why the land kind of felt like this was because, kind of like because of two things. One, because of lottery, but really two, because, of course, uh, God would have had a hand in how things played out. Um, and it was also within the taking into consideration population sizes, uh, or well, yeah. So, looking at it from the way that God would have chosen it, do you is there any reason or anything said anywhere, whether it's the Talmud or anywhere else, why it makes sense why Zebulun and Issachar would be together? Um, 
based on everything that we just talked about, but they're quite a distance away from Judah, uh, which, you know, they were in that same group. Is there any, do you know of any reason why that would be, or is there any explanation for that? Or is it just, that's just how, you know, God wanted it. Right. Well, you know, uh, we've been in touch with each other long enough to know that you'll know that everything has a reason. Everything has an explanation, probably 70 levels of it. Yes. Questions. Can we access even one? But the, the main thing here to realize is that the, the Judah and the Binyamin are where they are because they both had to have a portion in Jerusalem. In fact, the where the temple itself would sit. And then there was even a little, which this map doesn't really reflect, but there is was a piece of the tribe, uh, the land of Judah that went up into Binyamin in order to engulf parts of the temple so that the temple was not completely in one tribes or the other, even though the temple, uh, sorry, even though Jerusalem, that is, was not owned really by any one tribe and was the property of all the tribes. So that would at least explain why Judah would have to be where it was. Why Zavulin and Issachar, excuse me, were up in the, in the Lake Canary area in the Galil, I don't know. But I do want to point out something which you might find interesting if you really haven't noticed it, is look at Menashe. Menashe is yeah. far, head and shoulders more than anybody. Now, this, the Menashe on the right of the screen, mm -hmm. that's half of the tribe, right? Because if you remember, Reuben and God, who you see are also on that side of the Jordan River, they're the ones that came to Moses and they said, well, listen, we're overwhelmed with livestock and all the rest of this. You know, maybe we'll just stay here in Brooklyn and Boca Raton and Toronto. I mean, why do we have to go into Israel we're making so much money over here outside the land? So God, so Moses says, okay, you can stay here, but you have to send your kids into the army and not only into the army, but they have to be the frontline fighters with Joshua going out after the 31 kings. And only after everybody else is settled are you allowed to then return to your lands, which they agreed and fulfilled, by the way. But but what happened was, if you look carefully in the... I, I got to like lose that word carefully, because every time you open the Bible, it should be carefully. Mm. But in the story, you'll see that it only was Reuven... Uh, yeah, sorry. It was only Reuven and God who approached Moses... The question is, where did Menashe come from? Menashe is not one of the ones who asked to stay outside the land. So, and not only, not only did Menashe not ask to stay outside, he certainly didn't say, well, how about breaking me in half? So where did that come from? I don't know. It's been a All long right. time since I've read those uh, that portion of the, the Bible. That's okay. Oldie but goldie. So what it is, is because Moses realized that Menashe comes from Joseph. Mm -hmm. And Joseph had a tremendous great love of Israel to the point where he made the Jewish nation swear an oath that when they would leave Egypt, that they wouldn't leave his bones behind in Egypt, but take his bones with him and bury him in Shechem, which right. is the city that all the problems began. But that's another story. So he knew that... He, uh, sorry, so therefore Moses knew that Menashe, being one of the two tribes, would have a huge love of the land of Israel. So he realized by splitting them in half, the tribe that lived outside of Israel would be perpetually going across the border to visit their family in Israel. In other words, they would be the ones who would maintain that bond to the land of Israel. Because what Moses was afraid of, that if it was Reuben and God alone, at some point, they would say, hey, man, you know, we're Jewish and we're Orthodox and we have these beautiful homes in Boca Raton and, and we're making nice money and we have kosher food everywhere we go. Why should we possibly put us on a land where missiles come in from Gaza so that they would become detached? And Moses didn't want that to happen. So that's why he it was Moses' idea to do that with Manasseh, hoping that that would help Reuven and God maintain a connection with the land of Israel. Hmm. Okay. All right. Um, well, and just really quick before we move on, uh, Tel Aviv, wouldn't that be like if if it was on this map, would it be within Menasha over here somewhere? 
I, I don't think so. I think it would be within Dan. And I'll oh, tell you like why. down here. Yeah, because what's that? See the little red dot? I can't read it. Too, what's that uh, say? Joppa. Right, so that's where Tel Aviv is today. Oh, okay. Well, that's kind of like on the border of like uh, Manasha and, and Dan. Yeah, sort of. but that I, I don't know about the accuracy of this map. It's probably a yeah. very good suggestion. Okay. But Jaffa is Tel Aviv. And I'll even tell you something funny. The bus lines in Tel Aviv were almost for a while in the country's creation were called the Dan lines. Because oh, it was, really? yeah, for that reason. Nope, there were no buses called the Menasha Line. <laughs> that's really cool. That's a that's a cool little tidbit. For sure. Uh, uh, one last thing before we move from this map. Is there anything in particular about this land right here that they have? Like any uh, unique cities, sites, or anything special about the land that they received for Issachar and Zebulun? Well, I mean, what you can see is that Issachar has the very bottom of the Inerit Lake. Mm -hmm. And that bottom is where the lake then goes down the Jordan River into the Dead Sea. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, as you probably, and you know, controlling the water is a very big issue. And Torah is always... A metaphor of water because water always goes down as opposed to fire which always goes up it's funny we take a drink of water at that moment <laughs> and the water as it goes down it always it seeps it seeks the lowest level again coming back to humility so god's wisdom being a metaphor of torah being water is that god will look seek out the truly humble to give that person those people the greatest insights into wisdom. That's where God feels most secure. So therefore, uh, Issachar, being the, the great Torah scholars, controlled the lifeline of the water, metaphorically speaking and realistically speaking, in the land. By the way, just to tell you a very interesting thing, you know, as you can see, there are two primary lakes in Israel. One is that one in the north that's, I don't remember what you call it, but we call it the Knesset. Yeah, we uh, call it the um, Garrett, sorry. Galilee. Galilee. Well, you know, it's in the Galilee. Galilee is the area. But the lake itself, anyhow, is referred to as the Kinneret, mm -hmm. which comes from the word Kinor, which is a harp. And oh. the lower one is called the Dead Sea. Now, wh why is one living? Because the Kinneret is filled with fish, and it's a very alive lake. And the other one is completely dead. This is a question that one of the chief rabbis of Israel asked a few years ago. And he said the difference is because the Kinneret, the northern lake, it receives, right? Because if you go all the way up to where it says Don, you can see there that that's actually the beginning of the Jordan River there. So the Jordan oh, like, River. Like right up here somewhere. Yes, yes, exactly. It's right. Um, that area there, it comes, it gives and comes down into the lake. So the lake receives, but it also gives. But the other lake only receives. In other words, the Jordan River did not continue out beyond the, the end of the Dead Sea. And yeah. therefore, it's a, it's a lesson. To, even the land teaches Torah. So the lesson is to teach us that somebody who receives and gives is alive, but somebody only takes and doesn't give is dead. So is the spiritual lesson there um, because the Dead Sea is close to Jerusalem? So would the is there any sort of spiritual lesson where it's like it needs to be closer to Jerusalem because it's in the need of most it's in the most need of help compared to uh, what what's it called the Kinneret? Is that yeah is that Kinneret. Right? Kinneret? Okay. Is that so? Anyways, it, would that be kind of right? Oh, because very I, much so. Because like in all... Ezekiel, there's like the there's the um vision where uh water comes out from under the temple and it goes down and it heals the dead sea so i guess, I guess it's kind of you kind of see that lesson there well god willing when you come and we're running around the country together you will notice that when you drive out of jerusalem it's all downhill past dead sea level i mean sorry sea level all down 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 to get to the dead sea it's a real one long in fact i have friends who go on one hour bike rides and they, they say they get out of Jerusalem, they do one pedal, and then the whole thing is gliding for an hour, going all the way down past Jericho 
and then down into the Dead Sea. So it is the and plus the Dead Sea is the lowest spot in the world. Yeah. So yes, correct. Therefore, we have the highest spiritual place. You have to have the lowest physical place because there always must be this balance of the physical and the spiritual. That's what gives us our free will. But there's another thing is that when anything in the temple became impure to the point where it could no longer be sanct as, um, re-sanctified, so the, the language was that they would then throw it into the Dead Sea because nothing survives in the Dead Sea. That's why you can't even have boats in the Dead Sea because the, it just, the bottoms get eaten out by the salt rapidly. Yes. Yeah. So that was the idea of, of it. You know, and how did it become the Dead Sea? Uh, well, is it uh, maybe this is what you're getting at? Isn't this uh, traditionally the place where, uh, along the shores of it, that's where Sodom and Gomorrah were? Is that how? I, I'm almost wondering if you don't have it on that map, but I can't really read. Oh, that's Bethlehem. Yeah, it doesn't have it on here. No. What's yeah. that one city under Bethlehem? Bethlehem's on the uh, left. What's Hebron. Ah, oh, no. Okay. So yes, yeah, so I'll tell you where it is. If you were to go halfway between Bethlehem and Hebron. Okay. And now slide to the right. Right, mm -hmm. right around there is Masada. Oh yeah, Masada. I just, I actually just brought Masada up in a recent video. That's funny. Okay. Yeah. Well, there it is. That's where it is. And and not far from that is the areas of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, so like in this area right here, essentially. Right, so this these were a, a very living body of water and luscious vegetation and great you know place to live, but. You know, that's what happens. You get rich, you get fat, and you kick. Mm -hmm. And then you get yep. kicked. <laughs> God yeah. forbid. I hope, I hope I get to go to Israel sometime. I really want to. Uh, the closest that I'll get, as far as, like, the Dead Sea goes, we, we have one. Uh, it's actually, it's kind of interesting. It's a similar setup. I don't know if I talked to you about this, but. Salt Lake City? The Great Salt Lake. It's, like, the same kind of, it's the same kind of, like, setup, but it's upside down compared to israel there's um the great salt lake it's the same type of thing it's a terminal lake it's nasty it's gross it stinks and ah. you like and you float in it um uh, yeah then, that's right but then you, here you have salt lake right here and then utah lake would be the kind of like the same as canary but it, there's a jordan river it was called the jordan river because of the similarity but it, it goes up this way but now i'm wondering if there's like any sort of like lake or uh, river or anything that starts here and then like kind of like similar to israel i'll have to look at that later but by the way you know what the word jordan means no it means to go down your red in hebrew is to go down so the your red din the jordan river the j is a yu right that yeah. the the romans couldn't pronounce a yud so they said everything j that's why yehudi became jew instead of yehud so the Jordan River is really pronounced Jordan, Jordan. That's even a wine you could probably buy in America. The Jordan wines are delicious. I want and to put that, this down on here. So if we were to like spell it in English, you would probably spell it with like a Y. I want, I want to, I want to spell it the way that it would. Uh, you mean phonetically? Say, yeah, phonetically. So it'd be ah, Jordan like this, yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, actually, probably A I N is because Jordan. Oh, okay. And so it means, it literally means to go down. Right, you're red. The first part of the word means to go down. And the last is the Hebrew letter nun, which is, as we've spoken about, the number 50, which always means the passageway to the infinite, the 50th gate of wisdom. So therefore, when a person goes really, really down, God forbid, they actually can even there find God and find the passageway back to heaven. I'll go with that. And then I'll go back later and then put everything that you just said. That's a fascinating, it's a fascinating concept. Yeah. I mean, a simple level is because it looks like it goes down, you know, the side of the, that's the problem with maps. You think things go down. <laughs> it's flat, you know? Yeah. Uh, just to give every, everybody a visual, this is what I was talking about earlier. So here's a depiction of it with the tabernacle or the otherwise known as the Mishkan in Hebrew in the middle, the four groups of the, the Levites. Um, and then we're, we're in this video, we're concentrating on here. We already did Judah. We talked about Judah at the end of last video and at the beginning of this video. 
And so just to give you a visual representation, this would be uh, the encampment and then the order of March. Uh, now, th is this right here the way that it's depicted that yep. like Judah would be here, then is Sekar, then uh, yep. Zebulun? Yep. Okay. Well, the four across the top, those are the four. They're called camps. Mm -hmm. In the Hebrew, it's called a machne, it's a camp. In fact, the, the biggest marketplace in Jerusalem is called Machne Yehuda, Judah's camp, because part of Jerusalem is in Judah. And well, and then I should bring this up also just to remind everybody. Well, we've talked about this a number of times on the channel, and I've shown you the graphic that Rabbi Gerfine uh, gave me, uh, equating the the twelve tribes to the twelve months of the year, specifically the months on the on the Hebrew calendar, of course, not the Gregorian calendar. So, essentially, this first part here uh, would correspond to the spring months, with Judah uh, being Nisan. And then I, I don't know my months yet, but the next two would be like the, the next two spring months, right? Right. And today, actually, we just started the fourth month, which would now be Reuben. Oh, we to, to, today we just moved to Reuben. Yeah. What's what's the month right now? Tammuz. Tammuz. Okay. So now we are officially as far as as far well the way that the Jews would look at the calendar and the seasons, you would officially consider today the beginning of summer. Yes. Okay, so now we're in Re Reuben. Wow, what timing. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, uh, and it's funny because each, as you mentioned, each one equate to a different month. So uh, Reuben is the month of Tammuz, and then the horrific month, which is Av, which is when the first and the second temple was destroyed and many, many other bad news things that all began because of the 10 spies who came back with a bad report about the land of Israel, uh, which is why they were then condemned to remain 40 years, which was only supposed to have been two years in the desert before coming into Israel. That's called Av, and that's the tribe of Shimon. Now, you won't see this in your English letters, but the tribe of Reuben in Hebrew is actually, well, first of all, it's pronounced Ru'ev, Ruven, which means Ru'er, which means to see, Ben, to see the difference. The beginning of wisdom is to be able to see differences. When somebody says it's all good, that means they don't know anything. If somebody says it doesn't matter, that means they don't know anything. It's just a child. But an intelligent person knows how to distinguish, knows how to see the difference. I mean, you can't be a scientist. if You, you can't be an engineer if you don't know the difference between metals and materials and stress values and all the rest of these things. It can't be a doctor. I'm, I'm sorry, doctor, what vaccination should we give? It doesn't matter. It's all good, right? So you have to have that ability to see differences. That's the beginning. Now, Reuven is therefore associate, is, uh, occupies the South. And the South is always equated with wisdom. So the East, as like you said, is the shining of the light. It's heading towards the fulfillment of the future light of, of the world. But the South is the, this place of wisdom. How do we know that? Because in the tabernacle, the menorah, which was the candelabra of light, was placed in the southern part of the holies. Mm. And therefore, it was put there because it's south. South is always equated with the wisdom. Now, the menorah's uh, wicks, however, there were seven wicks, not to be confused with Hanukkah, which has eight. The menorah had seven. And there were three on each side. And those three wicks all were pointing towards the middle of the seven, like the one I can't do, something like that, whatever, the <laughs> middle one. Anyhow, that middle one then faced north. So the word in Hebrew for north is tzvon. And tzvon also means dark or hidden. It's a better word. Choshik is dark. This means hidden. So, therefore, the function of the menorah was to take holy wisdom, which has to be intelligent wisdom, and to shine it and illuminate darkness. Now, if you'll forgive me just to follow through on the thought, I know we're jumping around, but you might enjoy these weaves. Yeah. And the Absolutely. side of the darkness, the camp of the darkness, is led by Don. Mm -hmm. Now, 
what does the word Don mean? Where does that name come from? So Don means judgment. So you always have a left side and a right side. So if you think of Judah as going forward, then Don would be the left and Reuven would be the right. Yeah. Okay. So Don is the left and the left is always equated with judgment. Or in Hebrew it's pronounced Din, which is from the same letters as Don. On the other hand, the right is always equated with kindness. Acts of we call in Hebrew chesed. The word chesed, which means charity in Hebrew, is three letters. The first two is ches. It's ches, it's chetzin, which means to have pity. And guess what the last letter is? Dalit, just like we started the class tonight. Dalit meaning poor, right? Judah, Judah with a Dalit. Uh, so therefore, Chesed means to do kindness for the needy. That's what the word means in Hebrew. So therefore, the, what greater kindness could you give to those that are in darkness or those that are hidden, meaning the side of judgment, which is a very strict, that's where hell is, if you will. What greater kindness can you do than to share with them light, to bring them out of that darkness? So that's why the menorah was in the, on the side of Reuben, because he had the ability to see the differences and to be able to share it or point it at Don. Now, in Reuben, you have Shimon. Now, Shimon, or Simon, or however you were pronouncing it, but Shimon so is... Simeon, whatever. It does, yeah, Simeon. Oh, Simeon. Right, right, that's right. So uh, Sh Shimon comes to the word to listen, Shema. So therefore, Shimon is all about hearing. Now, there's an interesting thing between hearing and seeing, right? If you, if you look at the human head, you see that the, the bandwidth between the eyes are much closer than the bandwidth between the ears, because the ability to see differences is a higher level of wisdom than the ability to hear differences. You know, there's the old joke of the rabbi who's doing marriage counseling, and he's sitting in the room with a couple, and the woman is pouring out her problems with her husband, on and on and on. And when she finishes, the rabbi says, oh, okay, you know what? You're right. And the husband says, well, how could she be right? You didn't even let me speak. So he says, okay, speak, speak. So the husband begins on and on and on. And when the husband gets done, he says, oh, you know what? You're right. And at that moment, the rabbi's wife walks and says, what kind of rabbi are you? How can they both be right? He says, yeah, 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 you're right. So <laughs> the ability to be able to hear differences and see differences. This is where wisdom is all about. Now, that's why it's interesting, because Reuben and Shimon equate to these two months, one the month of Tammuz and one the month of Av. The month of Tammuz begins bad news. On the 17th day of this month is the day that Moses broke the tablets. Mm. There were only two of them, unlike the Mel Brooks version, which had three. But in the original, there were only two. And he breaks those, which is not necessarily good news, right? God yeah. gives you... Probably not yeah. a good thing. <laughs> What's that? Pro yeah, probably not a good thing. Yeah, probably not, even though God complimented him for it. But still, it's a shame it came to that. And that means it came to that because that's also the month of the golden calf. And then you have the month of Av, which really gets bad, nasty, with the destruction of God's own homes, twice no less. So why are, you would think that these stories of and intense judgment, the nation being judged by breaking the tablets, by destroying the temples, you would imagine that they should be on the other side of the camp. Because I just explained that the left side is a side of judgment. That's why the man who leads it, his name is Don from the word Din, which means judgment. Why would those events, those months, be on the side of kindness? And the answer is to remind us that when God brings judgment into the world, if the judgment can actually improve a person, then the judgment will come in a manner which is really ultimately a kindness. If a person, God forbid, has made themselves so dark and so bad that there's no way of retrieving them, then the judgment comes down without any kindness, and it removes them from the world, so they won't ruin their souls more. That's why 
in the case of Sodom and Amora, or Stom and Gomorrah, uh, there they had they had gone beyond the line of any return by Pharaoh. Pharaoh at one point had free will, but then he decided to harden his own heart. He decided, I I'm going to take on God and the Jews no matter what, because I got my own gods, and we'll be able to handle their, their little Jew god. And so therefore, he got taken out of the park. So when judgment is coming to the people who through their free will have abused the gift of life to go so dark into darkness, then that's heavy duty judgment. But if it's people who, because we are human, we're not animals, but we're not angels, and we struggle and we make even horrible mistakes, but somewhere down trapped in the well or trapped in the miner's cave is a really good person. So then God will break through, if you will, with unfortunate experiences that will ultimately result in wonderful experiences. In other words, if the real end game is the third temple, well, then you don't want the first second temple to be in the way. You want to clear them away for the third temple. So even as horrific as those events were, it's contingent upon something being so wonderful in the end game, which is the third temple, which is, I'm sure you're familiar with the verse in Isaiah 56, uh, verse 7. See, now I sound like you. And there it says that it will be a temple for all the nations. It's not going to be a Jewish temple. That's why Jewish nationalism is a bit of a problem for the Jews that believe in Torah. It's it's God's land. We're in God's land. We're not in Jewish land. We're in God's land. And God can bring and will bring anybody that God wants into God's land. It's God's home. We're just the people who work in the home, but it's not really our home. And that's why if we break the house rules, we go thrown out into exile, and we did it twice already. So the third temple will be a place where the whole world will be unified in its love and connection to God, or those that chose to be on the side of Israel in the end of days, where God will make it very difficult to be on the side of Israel, because this will be the real test. So that's what that's the period of time when right now is sort of there's this incredible rise of anti-Semitism and anti-Israel and and, and so much so much lies and fake news and, and, and distortion and anger. And this is going to lead to huge violence, but ultimately it will be a violence that will only consume those that have eaten anger. And the ones that have chosen a way of peace and recognition and respect, these will be the ones, like God said to Abraham, those that bless you will be blessed and those that curse you will be cursed. It's pretty simple. So anyhow, but that coming back to your issue, that's, that's where this relationship is. That's why Don is the last of the four. Like you rightfully pointed in that other diagram, when it unfolds, it's like it uncircles, if you will. Right? Because you would have thought that the two in the middle would go before the last one. Maybe just the question of which one was the first of the two, but it doesn't. It's sort of like a circle unfolds. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Uh, to finish this up, if you have just a few more minutes, um... I was hoping that we could go over just I, and we were talking about when I pulled this up that these are probably not entirely accurate, but um, hopefully everybody watching knows oh, they're, that they're, they're definitely things. cool. They look <laughs> cool. I would love to have like a nice thing on my, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So uh, hopefully everyone, everyone knows that there's basically there's different uh, symbols associated with the 12 tribes. And so for um, Issachar and where is it? In Zebulun. Right. So first of all, you notice right away, what's that symbol? It's a... This one right here? A ship. Yeah. Right. So like the, the business thing, like the what we were talking about, business. Yeah, about, they were the ones that controlled the ports, even though that was the tribe of Asher and, and Manasseh and Don. But they were the ones who were the great seafarers. Yeah. But on the other hand, I'll show you another problem. You have a little bit of problem, if you'll forgive me. Yeah. And that is sometimes these symbols are symbols about the individuals but they're not, excuse me, they're not the symbols of the correlating month. And I will give you one example. Could you just raise the screen a little bit? I want to see the, the mosaic looking ones there for a second. Just want to see what they have. Oops. Oh, Those see. Right here? Yeah. Okay. See, this is really going to show you why. If you look on this one at Yehuda, which is the second from the right on the top row, I know it's in Hebrew. This one right here? Yeah. That's Yehuda. Now, what do you see there? I'm sure you know what those items are. Yeah, crown, harp. <clears throat> Not sure what this is, but some instrument. 
Oh, really? I thought it was like a paddle bowl thing. <laughs> a ping pong uh, paddle? Yeah, a divine ping pong paddle. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, maybe it meant the viol. It was a weak effort at a violin because it looks like it's strings. Yeah. Yeah. It, was David, that. And it, has like, it has like the bow right there. Yeah. Right. It was King David unplugged. <laughs> so uh, so these are all obviously a relation, are relating to King David, right? Mm-hmm. And therefore, you see it's in Judah. Yeah. In fact, you. I hope you know the Hebrew letter enough that now if you look at his name, you see you have the four letters of God's name, except for the second from the right. Uh, sorry, this from the left. From that the one. Left, yeah, Dalit. Dalit. yeah. If you took out that dollar, then you have God's name written there in black and white. Yeah. Okay. Now, that's more authentic to Judah. Then if you go back to the other set of images, like the badges, now, there you go. Judah, they have a lion. See that? Yeah. Now, that's a problem. And it's really interesting because the the official flag of Jerusalem is a lion. And there's a lot of terms called the Lion of Judah. But the lion really is associated with the month of Av, which is the month of Shimon. Yeah. Right. So that, see, that's... That's what's a little problematic. You have to, you really need to, I can look this up for you if you like, to learn what were the images of the flags. Yeah. Because all the flags had different colors. Do you have something like that that you can do a a screen share? Oh, I can't do like in 10 seconds. I'm going to have to like prepare for next time, God willing. Okay. But I'm just pointing that out. Now, it's interesting though, if you look at Minashi, you have a unicorn. What was it? What is it over here? Uh, hold on, let me find Menasha is, you have to go down a little bit. Oh, well, th- this is it, like, this is the whole thing right here. Oh, I see why, because they have Joseph. Joseph is your middle row to the far left. Oh, okay. This one, one right more. here? Yeah. So therefore, you don't have Menasha and you don't have Ephraim. Okay, so this one is just like the actual, uh, like, sons, like the biological sons right. yeah okay right and that's why you have in the lower right hand corner the one that looks like a checkerboard that's yeah. really the high priest's uh yeah. plate the, the Uri Batumim, it's cool yeah right breastplate in english and that was why that tribe there is lady because the kohen is a subset of the levy yes okay okay so i get it so some of these are yeah okay but i want to just say point out about the unicorn which i think you would probably find a little bit interesting mm-hmm. and the unicorn uh where do you have the unicorn in the bible it's a very interesting question because uh, even in the english translations i've used let's say the ones that torah jews use for their translations they are every they're always afraid to translate the word as unicorn so what they'll do on that even like art scroll for example i don't know about safari but art scroll for example will give you a phonetic of that word Tarshish. There's an animal that's called a Tarshish. So rather than translating what it is, it'll just say Tarshish because it figures most people today in the Western world couldn't handle the idea that there was anything other than a mythological unicorn rather than a real unicorn. But in our tradition, there really is or was a unicorn. And the last of the unicorns was utilized for its skins that are part of the skins that covered the Mishkan. I, you know what? I was just reading um, in Israel 365 article written by Adam uh, Eliyahu Berkowitz. And he was, uh, tell me what you think of this. I think he was referring to the same thing because there was like a seal that showed up on, um, you know, somewhere along the shore of Israel. And he was saying that some people thought that it was a, a seal. Is that like the same thing or is it like for sure it was a unicorn that uh that was used the Talmud, for the the Talmud says that there was a unicorn that was used for its skins to cover the certain parts of the uh, tabernacle or mishkan mm-hmm. but for some reason i guess they're just afraid to in the english because they might think people will say ah how silly look they thought they were unicorns by the way just want to get no please Oh well, is there any is there any um anything any belief of using seal skins like a, a seal from the ocean for anything? 
Oh, that's what you meant by seal. I thought you meant yeah. like a seal when you stamp something. No, no, a seal from the ocean. Like there was like under their biblical news section of Israel 365, they did an article about a seal that was spotted on the beach somewhere. And and they were like, oh, this is, you know, a sign. There was a seal. And it was big news here a couple of weeks ago that a whale was washed up on the shore. Oh, really? Yeah. That was, but you can just Google that. Okay. Um, uh, I'm not really sure. Okay. I live up. I'm a mountain folk guy, you know, up here in Jerusalem mountains. I don't know what goes down there in the beach area, but I'll just tell you one thing. I want to just point this out for you. You know, one of the most fundamental ideas in Torah Judaism, which someday I pray all Jews will observe, is modesty. It's all about modesty, uh, and therefore to suggest, like you have here, not you, but they have here, Reuben, a naked woman. That is about the furthest thing from anything any Jew, especially in the days of Moses or Jacob, would have ever, ever permitted as an image. Yeah. So that's just kind of questionable where that even comes from, if not yeah. a little disappointing. Now, the one Naftali, though, that's sort of interesting because, the, again, some of these things are given because of the blessing that Jacob, you know, gave the children. And Jacob certainly didn't give to the child name, see the difference and go out and look at naked women. But in in the uh, Naftali, though, he's considered the one who runs like a deer. He's extremely, incredibly fast. So that's kind of probably where that image comes from. Issachar, again, you go a little bit more. There you have a donkey, because that, again, that ties back into the uh, blessings of Jacob. I'm imagining the one on God with the two colored soldiers is not a chessboard, but rather is probably some way the artist wanted to give the idea of God's soldiers leading Israelites in battle, as was the condition of Moses for them to remain outside the land. Um, oh, yeah, because over here, right here, God. That's right. So God and Reuben right below him. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, going back to Issachar, uh, what would this be, or like, would this be valid or represent anything? The the sun and the moon. Yeah, of course, from because a they point were, of view. because sure they were the ones that knew how to intercalculate the movements of the planets. Oh right, yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, but I mean, it, this is sort of some sort of artist who kind of like just took ad hoc different images, okay. and you know, because if you go up like to Don, mm -hmm. that one there, I have no idea what that's supposed to be. Looks like comes some sort of a serpent or something, flying serpent. Yeah, or like a phoenix or something like that. Yeah. Been, I don't know. Could be anything. <laughs> yeah. And Benjamin, uh, okay, that we know where that comes from because that's the wolf. Again, Jacob's blessing. And Asher is the olive tree. So I told you because Asher, the land of Asher, uh, the territory of Asher is the land where the best olive oil, or maybe not. There's one opinion that there was also great olive oil in a place called Tekoa which is a place a lot of my friends live in the West Bank. Uh, but primarily for, for good quality volume olive oil, that was Asher. Mm. Okay, cool. All right. Well, we're coming up, coming up on the, a little bit past the hour mark. So we should probably wrap it up here. Plus, plus sure. the Zoom is going to end in just a little bit. But um, okay. So, so now we have... Um, We've be, we've talked pretty good about this first group, and then um, next time, hopefully, we can get into them. I know that we we've touched on them today, but maybe talk about Reuben, Simeon, or Shimon and Gad a little bit more, and uh, just kind of like go on down the line if that's okay. Of course, it's okay. I'm happy to. Hey, it's a pleasure to know you. <laughs> you too. I'm really happy hey. that, like I say all the time, I'm happy that this is happening. It's it's a yes. very rare opportunity for me so i'm really happy about this it, but it, you should know it's a two-way road oh thank you <laughs> sure all right guys well that's going to be it for this one so un unless like things come up uh again we'll be doing this like every week um I'll talk to rabbi gerfine and just learn everything that he has to share and and see the jewish point of view on different things and uh learn some things for ourselves of course and um yeah if you haven't already please make sure to subscribe like this video if you liked it leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below also make sure to share it and i'll talk to you guys later